question you had, Elin. You were asking about the um, integration of your, was it height speakers or what yeah, was it? Rear surrounds? Yeah, what was your question again about crossover? Uh, just to... Uh, because there's there's a lot of information out there on what your crossover should be for height speakers. Mm. Um, you know, THX standard is 80, but a lot of people do 120. Some people do 150. Some people do 180. Um, and they they say it's you know ridiculous to have anything below 180, or else it'll interfere with the bed layer. So I was just curious what your mm. what all your thoughts on that, or what you're currently running, because I have yet to do some actual tests on crossovers for height speakers um now that i have this shed theater but um yeah before i do those tests i wanted to get your take on it too yeah so you know what let's take it to aaron i know he's not into you know height speakers at all but how about in car audio no what is the recommended crossover i mean you may have different size speakers right so you have or... subs but you have all different let's say you have front speakers different size right yeah Rear speaker, you know, you may have just various speakers of different sizes. How do you integrate those with a sub? Because I think that's kind of the same question to me. Right. So, yeah, I've actually got a video on that. Um, I made a couple of years ago, but a lot of people in car audio, they'll try to cross over their subwoofer low. Um, so meaning like what most people do is they try to cross their mid base, which are in, usually in the front doors or in the kick panels or something like that. They'll try to cross them over at like 50 hertz or something because they they want to get bass up front. So they think since the mid base is physically up front, then that's going to give you the more sound like you actually have bass up front. Problem mm -hmm. is, if you mess around with home audio or car audio enough, you know that the way that speakers interact with not just the room, but even with each other can create like cancellation modes, things mm -hmm. like that. And because of that, what typically happens, thanks to the car audio and always having the left side mid bass with a null around like 70 hertz, that creates a sound like it sounds like everything is going straight to that mid bass on the left side. So even though you cross over your woofers down at like 50 hertz, it still sounds like the bass is coming from behind you because of the null. So what I suggest people do is to not cross over the subwoofer and the mid bass that low, just cross them at like 80, cross them above where that null is on the near side, and then use your subwoofer, make sure you get the phase aligned correctly with the mid bass up front to fill in that null. And that's kind of like distributed modes, right? Like it's like subwoofers. If you have multiple subwoofers, <laughs> you're supposed to space them out so you can distribute the bass evenly, mm -hmm. but also to fill in the nulls and the peaks so they kind of counteract each other. If you have one subwoofer and you put it in this position over here, then it's going to sound different if you move it to somewhere else because of how it interacts with the room. And then when you add a second subwoofer, you can offset you know, that sound from where that subwoofer is. And just playing with placement between subwoofers can change the sound at your seat. And the same principles apply to car audio. So I would say 80 hertz, um, no lower than 70 hertz subwoofer crossover point for car audio. Um, if you're doing lower than that, you're probably like 95% confidence that you're doing that wrong and you could get better results if you crossed over 70 or 80 Hertz. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting that a lot of that, a lot of what you said is transferable to home audio, right? So 80 Hertz, that's what I would probably recommend as a general starting point. 80 Hertz is a good starting point. Of course you can mess with your system and try to figure that out. Um, but definitely you also said phase aligned. Right? So you want to phase align everything, right. meaning that all of the speakers, when they cross over, that they sum together. They sum right? together. Yeah. You know, you don't want them fighting each other at any point. And it becomes difficult when you have so many speakers. So time aligning is pretty, pretty easy, right? It's different. So time pretty aligning, making sure all the speakers play at your main listening position at the exact same time. Okay, we can do that. Right. Yeah. Sub included, a little bit harder because the waves, you can't do it with a typical measurement as accurately as high frequencies, right? But it does a pretty good job of trying to time align that. Um, but then most, uh, depends on your room correction, not all room correction does phase alignment all the way across, right? right. So that's the, that's the issues because let's say if you phase align to, you know, whatever, two speakers, it doesn't mean that they're exactly phase aligned to 
all your other speakers. They could be out of phase with some other speakers and in phase with your front speakers. Um, and that's that's going to lead to some issues because it can't fix both if it can't change the phase. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but something like Dirac, and that's why I think it does such a great job, is it can align the phase of all the speakers and then combine that with the sub. Now you have a very cohesive sound. So to simplify things, it's just you got to be phase aligned, right? Because it doesn't matter what crossover, if they're fighting each other, that's never a good thing. Um, and then the other thing is what I prefer to do is I prefer to have my crossover at around the same point. Because if you think about something panning around, right, it's panning around through all your speakers. And let's say all of them are set to 80 hertz, but then you have small height speakers and it's it it has to be crossed over 120, right? So it's 80 hertz, 80 hertz, right? And then so uh, basically, if you're panning something that is 80, uh, 81 hertz, right? You pan it around, okay, it doesn't need to use a sub, theoretically. You know, of course it does, but you know what I mean? Let's say uh, you pan it around, but when it gets to those height speakers, it does need to use a sub. So all of a sudden, it goes from not playing to the subs playing. Is that noticeable? Kinda. Is it supposed to be noticeable? Suppose, you know, theoretically, it shouldn't, right? The- theoretically, you should never be able to notice a difference. But I, I'll tell you right now, if you have a near field sub like me, like it's, you know, next to the couch, all of a sudden, like it's, it's shaped. Okay, I notice that. Yeah, right? that makes sense. <laughs> It's the difference. So I'd rather it. I'd rather all of the speakers be uh, crossover at the same uh, point. That's that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah, I think 80 hertz is a good place to start. But you also have to do phase alignment. You have to do time alignment, level matching, all the right things. You know. If only there was a way we could just <laughs> put some stuff in those high channels and see. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Reverend Slim says Atmos heights are technically full range where you cross them over depends on the capability mm-hmm. of the speakers and how it integrates. And I remember Joe was telling me about this discussion that Reverend, Reverend Slim said he needs to change out his, his high channels and to get something bigger. Um, yeah, because he's starting to localize, right? So anytime yeah. I, I was showing him a demo, right? I made some like, you know, Atmos demo and I showed him and it's like, supposed to be something happening over here. But because his speakers back there are small, it activates a sub that's somewhere in the front, right? Mm-hmm. And so when when it happens, he kind of can tell because it's at around, I think, maybe 110, 120, not, you know, you start getting to the point where you can start localizing higher up in frequency. And so it's high up. And so he can hear it. He's like, it's supposed to be over here, but the su- I can hear the sub. So that could be an integration thing too, right? If they're not well integrated, you will be able to localize it more, right? If there's a slight time delay, phase alignment issue, whatever. So it depends. But do you, uh, Aaron, do you think that it would be possible though? Let's say as high as 120 without anything rattling. Let's pretend there's nothing rattling in the room, making it obvious. Yeah. Yeah. 120, would it, would it be able, would you be able to seamlessly blend a speaker to a sub and not be able to tell it's from the sub at 120? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, assuming that the sub will do it. Yeah. Well, and what I mean by that is like some sub, like you have like huge subwoofers and they have high inductance. That just means they start rolling off. It's kind of like an internal low pass filter. Um, mm-hmm. So sometimes you'll run into that with like large 15s, huge magnets, a lot of throw to them, a lot of excursion to them. Uh, 15s, 18s, usually like below 15, I would say you're probably going to be okay mm-hmm. anyway. Uh, but then the other thing is just like any other speaker design, where you're trying to match the radiation pattern of a tweeter to that of a mid-range, that still applies with a subwoofer to a bookshelf speaker. So you don't want to get any further apart than about a half a wavelength, definitely not any more than a half a wavelength um, of wherever you would want to be crossing over at. So uh, if you say 100 hertz, that's, I can't even do the math in my head, 100 hertz, is that 13 inches or so? 13, I don't know. I'd have to do the math in my head, but I'm just going to make up numbers. So for example, let's say 100 hertz is, no, I'm going to do this real math in real time. Because somebody's going to say, oh, you didn't do it right. And I was like, oh my God. Only you would put yourself on the spot. It's 135 inches. Let's say it's divided by two. So it's 67 inches. So it, if you crossed over at 100 hertz, 
-hmm. assuming that you, you know your crossover thing, alignment, phase alignment is all good. Uh, you could theoretically place the subwoofer 67 and a half inches away from your main speakers. Now, more ideally, it would be no further than 33.75. So that's speed of sound divided by 100 hertz divided by four. So it's a quarter wavelength. Uh, but if you wanted to go up to, let's say, 100 and let's say 200 hertz, right? Because that's kind of like if you ran a three way, if you built a custom designed three way speaker and your subwoofer with your mid bass driver would play 20 hertz to 200 hertz, you don't want the distance between the center of that mid bass driver to be any further than about 17 inches or so than the center of your mid range driver. So the distance between the center to center of mid range driver to subwoofer driver or mid bass driver at 200 hertz would be about 17 inches for a quarter wavelength. So you don't want those drivers to be any further apart. Otherwise, you get comb filtering, which just means that the radiation patterns are different enough where you can get off-axis cancellation and off-axis addition. And it basically just means that like, as you go away from the speaker to the side, the reflections that are sent out into the room to the side are going to be very frequency dependent and angle dependent on how it sounds in your seated position. So basically, like if, if you're talking into a room and I'm looking dead at you and then you step off to the side, well, <clears throat> I'm pretty much going to sound the same no matter what, because I'm one point source. But if I've got my voice and another voice of me overlapping, but I'm far enough away, then as you start moving off to the side, you start hearing different sounds and I no longer sound like one coherent source. And that's kind of it. So, yes, you could go 120 hertz. It's not a problem. You can go 200 hertz, but you've got to be mindful of. How far is that subwoofer from the mains? And you can get away with this in home theater and car audio as well, because if you're crossing over like 80 hertz, uh, we'll just do the math again. Mm -hmm. Quarter wavelength for 80 hertz is 42 inches. A half wavelength is going to be, what, 84 inches, something like that? So that's, that's really long. That's How many mm -hmm. feet is that? That's seven feet. So, I mean, you could theoretically have your speakers three to seven feet apart and you're going to be fine at 80 hertz. But the higher frequency you go, the closer the it gets. And everything. Jeez. I know Elon well, so, last you're like, I can't believe this dude. Like, he, he's, he's getting crazy <laughs> over here. He's like, hey. He must be like, hey, this Aaron, I, just know he, I didn't know he, he knew all this. Yeah, Everybody else our, is like, I don't right care. There. That's our dude right there. Yeah. Oh, man. That's, that was fascinating. It was, it was cool down. to see the wheel spin. <laughs> he got down right there. Um, fun stuff. Yeah, you know, what I've noticed, though, is a lot of times with home theater subwoofers in a, you know, pra just practically speaking, once they get past, uh, you know, depending, depending on the size of the sub, you know, 150 is pushing it. Once you start getting in that range, you start hearing some bad noises from that sub, right? Like some ringing. It just sounds like you hit like breakup modes. So it just doesn't sound very good for some reason. And uh, I think that's why a lot of them just by default they don't play any sounds below 150, you know, just by default. You can make it if you crank it all the way up, but it's not it's not going to sound good. Um, have you noticed that either? Has anybody noticed, like, if you let a sub play some of the higher like frequencies? Higher? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't ever let mine go 150. No. Do you know that noise that it makes? That ring noise? Above 100 because you end up hearing where the sub is in your room. The wall. Yeah. Yeah. So I've noticed that when I test some subwoofers, it's like the resonance. Like a lot of times, what you'll find is you'll have a port mm -hmm. resonance. So mm -hmm. if you look at like mine or James Larson's frequency response when we test like Monolith or SVS, and mm -hmm. we'll test it ported and then we'll right. test it like we'll seal it up. And right. you can see a clear resonance that's not there when you seal it up. And it's usually like, I mean, it depends on the size of the woofer, the enclosure, and stuff like that. But let's say typically for like a 15 inch, Mm -hmm. It's going to be around 200 hertz or so. Like that's kind of in that ballpark. Yeah. So certainly I can understand what Joe's saying. And on one of those cheap mono price subwoofers, like the $99 one, mm -hmm. I had an issue with it at like 100 hertz. Like I, I even made it in the video. I started ramping up the the uh, signal generator, and I was like, "Y'all listen to this." And you're trying to capture like a resonance on a subwoofer, you know? Like, uh -huh. but I think it, it kind of enough people could kind of figure out what I was talking about. But it was the the uh, plate amp. Something was rattling on the plate amp, oh. so I took it apart and tried to check it out, and couldn't figure out what it was. But something was rattling on that, so that's a, that's a that's a case where you can run into something like you can easily, and that makes it more detectable. So then it's not even so much like the sphere of sound; it's there's a specific resonance in the speaker itself that mm -hmm. will draw attention to itself. 
yeah, so so hot tip for you guys. Anytime you have uh, a speaker, right? And if you're going to be using the banana plugs, make sure that those terminals are screwed down, right? Mm -hmm. If you've ever made the mistake of having them kind of unscrewed a little bit and you're playing something like, what does that sound? What is it coming from? It's the, the terminals rattling. But for sure, uh, it all goes along with what Aaron is saying is you want to make sure to not have resonances either, either in the speaker itself or in your room. It could be like in something rattling over here, right? So if that's happening, you're going to start localizing because you can hear the high frequ higher frequencies from the rattling of whatever it is, your frank picture frame, whatever it is, right? So hopefully that answers your question, Elon. I know that you were saying that some people are recommending higher frequencies for some reason. What, I don't understand the point of that. What, what's the point of the yeah, higher? Well, I think I think it kind of goes with um, just how you mix music. Like in order to mix music, because you know you've got the bass, you've got the guitar, you've got the or maybe a lead guitar and an acoustic or rhythm guitar, uh, and then you've got I don't know piano on top of that and violins and all those things happening at once. Like in order to make those sound cohesive and not completely muddy, especially around like two hundred to seven hundred hertz, you've got to do a lot of frequency carving. Mm -hmm. uh, in order for those to actually fit like a puzzle piece and sound good together playing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I kind of get how you might not want your height channels to be like less than 120 hertz just because those hertz from 120 to 80 or 60 or whatever might kind of interfere and get muddy with mm -hmm. the bed layer speakers. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I can, I can kind of see the, 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 how some people might mm. consider that when when doing the crossovers for the high frequency or for the high channels. Yeah, well, I mean, um, go ahead uh, with those uh, with those upward firing Atmos ones. They like Klipsch wouldn't tell you what the frequency response was on those things because they actually yeah. had to do something weird to make that bounce happen, and they would mm -hmm. say to set the um, set the crossover to 120. So like yeah. those numbers, 120, 150, those are because of uh, some of those um, Atmos speakers. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, if it's an Atmos speaker, you know, it doesn't have to be one of those bouncy ones. And, you know, the answer to that is no, it can be a bookshelf speaker, it can be in ceiling speaker. Um, and based on how that speaker performs is where you would want to put your crossover point. You know, I have some, um, I, you know, I had, I, when I made the switch to, from the Klipsch ones to the SVS, I went down to 100. And then when I put the, um, focal ones up there I have now I went to 80 and then in the studio that's in the living room in the studio since I have the same all speakers are exactly the same it works with that pioneer uh, where I can only set one crossover point so they're all set to 80 um, mm -hmm. and those are those uh, mono price mono oh yeah these are awesome so so here's the thing uh, Elon I think that the carving all that is supposed to be done in on the production side, right? So they need to separate out their sounds. Your speakers are supposed to be, they, they mix for full range a lot of times. If they're mixing for a theatrical mix, they're assuming that you know, all the speakers can play all the sounds, right? So I don't think that they're mentally thinking, like, okay, these are going to be in the rears. Let's, let's high pass them. No, they, they just put the sound in there, right? And then let your, your, your thing is going to do the bass management. But I don't see any need to uh, go higher than what the speaker can actually do right like if the speaker can do 80 comfortably yeah why not 80 right there there are other reasons to do it but i don't think it would be for that to you know to try to carve out the sounds because realistically if you think about it you you want everything to be cohesive you shouldn't be able to uh, uh, hide speakers now right it is preferable to not be able to tell you know when something's in the height speakers right, right. necessarily you know yeah Make sure to check out our audio-only version of the podcast at anchor.fm forward slash daily hi-fi or just go to your favorite podcasting service and search for daily hi-fi.